who wishes to fight, must first count the cost. Sun Tzu, The Art of War So what do you remember about what happened last time? Who wants to do a, a recap for us? Maybe Brown Sugar should do it since she's the only one in normal. That's true. She's the only one with a fully functional mic and a fully functional voice. Oh geez, we might all die. We'll be fine. Uh, I can do it if, you, if no one else wants to. So last time, you met the members of the Rebel of Velico, led by Mandukai Alarmuti, whose joy is fire, high priestess of the dunes and champion of Velico. Also, you met Karis Johnson, whose voice whispers storms, uh, the vice reveler Velico, Belcamp de Wayan, who doubts his worth, Algar Trag, whose hands shape the rhythm of love, and assorted other members. After learning that Lean is still alive, but unfortunately Hector is not, you uh, also heard that your town, much of it, survived the purge due to some weird thing Lean did to the sun. The town has been evacuated and Many of its members have gone underground, and you met up with Jolly again. Jolly survived, and that was an exciting time for everyone. Following that whole deal, you went up to explore the ancient structure that the Revel uses as the entrance to their underground oasis, and soon discovered that it was, in fact, an ancient spaceship, which um, Emrin could interact with uh, sort of in an engineering manner, the physical aspect of it. And uh, Keva could interact with using her blending powers to sort of coax the ship into doing different stuff. And she learned that the ship wants to go fast. Yes. And while Keva and Emrin were interacting with the ship, as it turned out, the people outside were trying to tell you to stop, but it was difficult to notice that. So you lit up the area pretty well, which uh, acted as a beacon for the nearby patrols from the church, seeing as they have stepped up their patrols of the area around Sector 3 following the incident. When we left off, you were preparing to evacuate or fight, or evacuate and fight, or just leave, uh, and you, you had uh, some difficult choices ahead of you. You know that your ship can carry about 75 people of the 600 who live at the Revel. There are also the animals there to think about, and they've asked you to take uh, the children, of which there are 50 on your ship. Mandukai transformed into a glowing pink and purple and green and gold force and flew away to uh, deal with the approaching troops. The rebels started to arm themselves, those of them who could, which was not very many, and Emrin went up to join them, while Keva, uh, last I checked, remained on the ship, and Zonin and Maeve were also... Let's see, Maeve was trying to set up a trap of some sort with bugs. And what was Zonin doing? I don't remember. Something cool, I'm sure. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt, no doubt. Hi, Sander. Okay, so we are going to pick up directly from there... Uh, are there any questions about last time or anything that you remember differently from I did? No? I think we're good. I almost cried because of Jolly. I was very happy. You missed that. Oh, okay, good. That's, a, that's an, a worthy addition to our recap. So let's uh, go through and introduce ourselves in the usual order. Hi, everyone. I'm your cyborg players, and um, I play Keva Jarma, the mom with the mostest, bestest hair ever. Tea mom, I mean. She's not physically a mother goat child. A mother goat child is what we heard on this end, and we're just going to run with it. <laughs> mother of goats. Mother of goats. And speaking of mothers of creatures... Hello, everyone. I play Maeve Sentis, mother of spiders and the heart of the swarm. And your OG brown sugar. Oh, indeed. And you can find uh, Keva's player on Twitter at be a space cat. Yes, thank you very much. How about Emran's player? Howdy, everyone. My name is Michael Blood. You can find me on Twitter at GoodSirBlood. For the purposes of the podcast, I play Emran Pak, and I'm going to get everyone killed. It's entirely possible. And uh, if you're confused about... Well, we'll talk about that later. And finally, Zonin's player. Hi. Oh, gosh. I'm J... <laughs> oh, boy. It sounds like Winnie the Pooh. I'm Jason, and I... Uh... Uh, can be found on Twitter at Singing Chemist, and I play Zonin Chan, um, half hat maker, half grover enthusiast. Yeah, so uh, pretty much everyone 
has got audio issues today, so this should make for a fun recording. Uh, but we are going to soldier on and do our best because we only meet once a month, and we've got to make it count. And it's the most wonderful time of the year. It's getting there. Okay, so when last we left off, Mandukai had streaked off into the distance, trailing a pink fire and her bells and ribbons, all made of this strange glowing substance that seemed to make up her body at this point. Karis was organizing defenses along the ridge that you see just to the north of the oasis. Uh, Bell Camp and Algar were setting up next to some type of machine. There was also uh, Thed Lee was there, and our key, and of course, how could I forget, Yartha Lang. And she was uh, annoyedly getting some of the troops rallied as well. She seems to be one of the more martially minded members of the Revel. Approaching from the north, you saw a platoon of infantry and a group of scouts slightly to the west of them, but they are more difficult to see. Emrin, you were next to Karis. Karis is stringing a long bow of a style that uh, does not look familiar to you. Strangely enough, Karis also has on their, um, on their right hand an auditor's glove going all the way up to their elbow. Karis turns to look at you and says, Are you sure you're ready for this? I've been waiting for a very long time. Karis nods and says, I need you to support Algar and Belcamp. Understood. We need them for what they can do, but they are defenseless. They aren't made for this. Safe. See that you do. And I nod and run over to Algar and Belcamp. Uh, Belcamp has got his guitar out and uh, he has run one of those cables that you're familiar with from the from the hub from the guitar into the large machine next to him and uh, currently he's strumming some of the keys on the guitar but they aren't making any sound and Algar is over at the machine she's doing something to it uh, I mean you can hear these things but uh, obviously if you want to see you have to do your usual deal I think I'll project my vision through my uh, my blade again Okay, uh, so you'll do your will roll, and we'll see how that goes. To go through the blade, which was forged by your father, you'll only need a fair will roll. Four. You got it. You've succeeded, and you can now see the area around you uh, quite clearly through the blade of the sword, or through its pommel, whichever you decide you're looking through. In fact, anything that you're currently wearing made of that material, you can switch to different points of view. So you're finding with that roll that you can sort of switch focus so if your sword's moving around too much you can switch over to your shield uh, and so on excellent so uh yeah you can see them doing this and working on the machine and algor sort of uh algar sorry looks up at you and she uh, beckons you over to the machine i rush over immediately and um she sort of puts her hand on it and uh, strokes it a little bit uh, and she looks concerned and then she looks at you questioningly do you want me to try and talk to it she nods. Okay. I uh, put my shield on my back and touch my hand um, in, a, in a similar place to where she has hers. You can see that inside of this machine, it does have that uh, material that you can manipulate and see through. And there appear to be some connections that are broken. Could I feasibly fix them in the time that we have, or should I try and jump and jump the connection? You could try to fix them. You haven't tried moving this stuff very much yet, but you were moving energy around inside of it before, so maybe that's something you can do. If you want to try that, you'll need to make a good roll using your will. Emrin's definitely going to give it a shot. Let's see how it goes. Perfect. Yeah, that's not a good roll, unfortunately. That's a mediocre roll. So you, you try to manipulate these filaments that are not connected within the machine, but uh, you're finding it like they're slipping through your hands as if they were made of I don't know, something slippery. Seaweed. And uh, it's, it's difficult to get a grip on them. It's like they're too small and too slippery for you. I'm struggling. I'm used to larger connections. Yeah, those are the only ones that you've had experience with so far. Okay, do you say anything to Algar when you fail to do this? I think I'm going to need more time. There's a bunch of disconnections in the machine. Algar nods and uh, gets out a... She has around her waist a tool belt. You see a, a variety of tools, many of which you recognize some of which you do not, and uh, 
Some of them have those little glowing lights on them that you've seen on a lot of the technology in the hub and in the ship. And then of course, on one side of her tool belt, she's got her, her drumsticks. And she gets out some of her tools and starts to unscrew uh, a hatch on the side of this machine. I'm just gonna have her make a roll. I'll help her if I can. You probably can. Uh, so I'll add a plus one to her crafts roll here. Okay, yeah, she she got an epic crafts roll. So she is able to, with your help, pry off this panel, and the two of you sort of start digging around inside there. You can guide her towards the broken connections using your vision, and uh, she, with her more nimble fingers and her tools suited to the purpose, is able to start patching them back together. Okay, let's see. Keva, where are you? Well, you know, on the spaceship, connected to the ship. Okay, so you're still in the pilot's chair. Yes, but Keva has kind of like talked, like urged Jason to go help bring the kids on board and animals, like some animals, like sadly, maybe more like food producing animals like goats. And then if there's any room, like enough goats to provide some sustenance and then maybe some adults like parents or caretakers. Hmm. Okay. So there isn't enough space to bring enough adults and enough goats. Because you have a way with animals, it might make yes. sense for you to feel compelled to prioritize them over these people you barely know. But if you do, it's going to be more difficult down the road to care for these children. Mm. So you can either accept my compel there or give me a fate point to refuse it. I'm gonna give you the fate point because uh, I think it's kind of like, oh yeah. Okay, so take away one of your fate points. And uh, so you're speaking with members of the Revel and you're telling them you need enough caretakers for the children and you'll bring some goats. And are you bringing yes. the dogs, Belly and the other one whose name I forgot? Are there only two dogs? <laughs> Those are the only two you've seen so far. Oh. Keva's not going to deal with that. She's going to leave that up to the people. Okay. They will start... Uh, they will start... Jolly's coming, loaded. though. Well, Jolly's here with you. She hasn't gone anywhere. Good. Not losing her again. Understandable. Also, Zonin can totally take uh, the first mate's chair, or whatever it is. Where is Zonin? Uh, I was also in the sh uh, in the ship, and I will join Ke uh, Kevin in the cockpit. Okay. Kevin needs some emotional support right now. Uh, one of the members of the crew here, right? One of the people who is helping load uh, the ship comes up to you, Zonin, because they can see that you're not weirdly plugged into the ship. They say to you, uh, "Can you help us escort the children onto the ship?" Oh, absolutely. Uh, I'll get right to it. Okay. Uh, so as you head out of the ship and down the back ramp, you can see, again, there's the bustle of activity. You can see the uh, dust cloud to the north of people approaching the uh, the army of Gov, or at least the detachment of it that's on its way here. Uh, but you head down into the oasis, and you can see people are starting to get a couple of the goats ready, like four of them is what they're going to be able to fit, uh, in addition to Jolly, so five total. And uh, you can see a person standing, petting, belly, uh, and crying uh, before that person eventually uh, wrenches themselves away from the dog and runs up towards the ship. Uh, a little ways further into the giant geode, you see uh, the group of 50 children, and there are a couple of adults around them trying to get them organized, like, okay, everybody hold hands, and they've got a rope that everyone can hold on to with the other hands, so they all make sure they're in the right place, and the kids are, some of them are crying, some of them are laughing, one of them tries to pull away and run to their parents, but uh, a man grabs that kid and sort of puts him back into the line and is sort of being a little gruff with the kid, but mostly because he doesn't really seem to know how to deal with children. Can I interrupt Zonin before he gets too uh, muddled in with the Utes? Where are you? I thought you were outside. I was on the deck with them. Okay, so I remember you telling me you are at the ridge, but all right, sure. No, I was uh, gathering doing the whole bug thing while I was yeah. on the ship. Okay. I'll just saddle up to zone in and go, um, this is important, but you do have Matt Damon 
and the blasting hand. It's up to you, but I think the best defense is the best offense in this case. So you may want to join Emran and myself up there. Oh, okay, I'll see what I can do. I'll try and get this done real quick. I'll see you soon, hopefully. And then I'll go to the ridge. Okay, head over to the ridge. Uh, Zonin. Yes. What you doing? So I'm I'm gonna go uh, find the group of children, and I'm going to do my best impression of beloved children's character, um, baked treat enthusiast. Yep. Um, which is a, a very well known kind of like you know um, nursery rhyme type thing, just like passed down generation to generation, just this kind of monster of sorts that loves baked goods. Yeah, it's in the children's books, of course. Yeah, and so um, I do that... Imp- well, my voice is working now, so I, I do my best impression of baked biscuit enthusiast. All right, they, uh, the children sort of look at you. Some of them are thrilled. Others are a little bit scared to see that voice coming out of uh, someone who's not baked biscuit enthusiast. But uh, the man who is sort of manhandling that one kid turns towards you, looking sharply, and says, Ah, uh, uh, you're Zonin? Yup. You came with Keva. Yes, this is true. He sort of looks furtively around as uh, the other adults are helping to corral these children. Oh my gosh, it's happening. He says, is she okay? Yeah, she's she's just on the ship. Why don't, why don't you go see her? I, I can't, I can't do that, I can't. But is she okay, not just now? Yeah, I mean, she's, she's more than okay. She's the only reason I'm here. He sort of smiles and you can see his eyes are wet and he, he puts a hand on your shoulder and he says, please take care of her. Okay, I will, but let's get these kids in the ship. Right. Um, and you sort of turn away to help get the kids in the ship. Uh, and when you look back around, that man is gone. I gasp suspiciously, like... <sighs> and you can see him, like, walking away. But he's not... <laughs> he didn't disappear. Okay, I turn slightly to the left and then go, oh, okay, never mind. Yeah, he's, he's on his way out somewhere. It looks like he's heading towards the ridge. Uh, but he did look familiar. Okay, well, I mean, you can try and roll on that if you want to try and figure out who that was or why they looked familiar yeah, to you. Yeah, I will, um, I will do, uh, I don't know, what kind of thing with a, a notice check? Yeah, it sounds like notice or investigate, one or the other. Actually, yeah, if you're thinking about it now, like, who do I know, it would be investigate. Well, I definitely don't have investigate as a skill. You can just roll it out of plus zero. Okay. I, uh, my notice is also plus zero, so I roll it two. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, you can't bring any names to mind, but you're sure that you either saw him or someone who looks exactly like him around back in town 3-7, but it was a very long time ago, like when you were a small child. He has a certain resemblance somewhere around the nose to Keva. Okay, I'll, I'll keep that in mind. And, uh, are the kids in the ship? You are escorting them up to the ship. It is, it is not easy to do. Uh, I would like you to roll rapport to try and get the kids um, on your side. You need to make a, a fair rapport roll, which uh, fair is plus two, I think, and you got it. All right. So, um, how do you how do you help herd these kids into the ship? Um, I I doing my best biscuit enthusiast um, character voice. I remind the kids that. Um, the goat burglar um, will get them if they don't get on the ship, which is like another kind of like, you know, beloved children's character. Yeah, of course. Yeah, everyone knows the goat burglar. Does he wear like a mask and a weird hat? Yeah, his hat actually. Um, well, one of the reasons why the goat burglar is such a beloved character that Zonin loves is because um, the hat was actually based off of one of Hattrick Brimstone's original creations. Oh, wow. That's very sweet. Uh, all right, so you're able to get the kids onto the ship, and uh, you're settling them in the... Oh, boy. Okay, hold on. What are the sides of a ship called? Port and starboard, which one's which? Port's on the left. Four-letter word. That makes sense. You're getting them set up in the port side of the ship uh, because there's a big hole in the starboard side. I heard that starboard, you can tell that it's the right side because starfish are right-handed. That's quite the mnemonic. <laughs> Thank you, Animal Crossing. <laughs> of course. <laughs> All right. Um, so yeah, there's a hole in the uh, starboard side, 
And is anyone going to do anything about that hole? Or are we just leaving that? Well, I had talked last time, I'm pretty sure, about if we needed to patch it or something. But you had said that it was big enough that we didn't have, like, time to do anything about it. You certainly don't have time to repair it. But maybe you could, like, throw a tarp over it or something if you got some help. Yeah, is that uh, far enough for me to not sever my connection with the ship to go and take care of that? Uh, you would have to disconnect to go over there. Does the ship not want me to disconnect? The ship wants to go fast. Okay, well, Keva will disconnect and take care of that. Okay, the ship feels disappointed as you disconnect. Can I tell it that I'll be back soon? <laughs> uh, roll your rapport. Okay. It's telling you not to let go, Rose. That was a two. Okay. Um, and you're not lying, so it can sense that you are uh, genuine and it reluctantly lets you go, but you can still feel that eagerness within it and there's still some disappointment that it's not going now. Uh, but you head into the starboard side where there's the hole that uh, people used to be coming in and out of, the entrance to the lair or the oasis down there. Um, and yeah, you can probably get together some of these tarps and wall hangings and carpets and stuff. Tack those over the hall hole. Yeah. Zonin, do you want to come help with this? Zonin? Uh-oh. Alright, we'll come back. Did I lose everybody, or is it just Zonin I can't hear? Oh, no, I'm right. still here. Okay. I'm here. Alright, let's pop over to Maeve. You said you were heading up to the ridge. What are you doing up there? Are you just uh, continuing to marshal insects for an ambush, or what else do you want to do? Uh, push the talk. I'm um, sorry. Uh, I will try to assess what the current situation is in terms of uh, the Rebels number and the EO number. Alright, that sounds like a lore roll to me. You're trying to figure out, like, uh, what the odds are here, or what's your... what do you want to know? Um, yeah, kind of the odds and just the general positioning. Okay, and you do have some experience with that from your military training, so we'll say this needs a good roll, or lore. Okay, definitely just looking at this like a risk board. Yeah. Uh, so that's not a good roll. You could add to it, or you could just accept that it didn't quite work out. Um, I will add to it. Okay, what are you going to use? Um, I will add Chaos as a Ladder, since this is Maeve's first opportunity to actually put a dent in the Evangelical Order. Okay, so you spend your fate point, and you refocus your formidable mind on the task at hand. Try to clear away the distractions and that feeling in your gut that Maeve doesn't want to acknowledge. And that brings you up to a four. So you can see that things are not looking good numbers-wise for the Rebel. You know how well-trained the infantry is, especially the infantry that gets to go on patrols outside of the sectors, and you're aware of just how effective and sneaky those scouts can be. They could be anywhere. There could be more of them. You don't know. Plus, you heard in the distance uh, the sound that is probably an auditor on its way. This seems like a fairly hopeless stand. So it's difficult to tell what Mandukai is capable of. Um, I will tell, um, I will tell Karis that I will focus on trying to root out where those scouts are, and I'll let them know. All right, Karis. Can I focus. Uh, Karis nods at you, and uh, they say, "All right, uh, I'm worried about them flanking Mandukai, so any additional help is appreciated." Can I focus my swarm in trying to let me know where they are? How do you want them to do that? I mean, they might be really sneaky, but they're still making, you know, vibrations and tracks and stuff in the sand. Yeah. So I'll just cast a white net and see if my bugs can keep me appraised. Okay. Uh, so roll your will, and you need to just get an average roll on your will here to get them to sense vibrations and tag you about where they are. All right, you did it. And you succeeded with style, which is good in this case. Uh, you start getting impressions from a lot of different insects in the area. Uh, a lot of them, because you succeeded with style, you can easily dismiss as the uh, the infantry. They're easier to pick out. So you're able to zone, zone in on where the scouts are hiding, and you can see that they are rapidly approaching along the west, at least the ones that you can find. Zone in? Ha ha ha. Indeed. Nah. I will relay that information to Karis, and am I able to kind of dispatch some of the bugs to follow them? Yeah, I mean, the bugs are... There's bugs everywhere out here. It's the night in the desert, so they're all out skittering about. Um, so 
Yeah, I mean, you can you can just follow them through the network of bugs. It's not like these scouts are trying to hide from insects. They don't know. They don't know about you. So I'll just say that you can, you can keep track of this group up here. Uh, as you're doing that, you sense that some of them have stopped. And uh, from what you can see through the insects in that area, they are drawing their bows and they appear to be getting ready to fire on Mandukai as she streaks across the desert towards the infantry. Are you using push to talk again? Yep, sorry. Um, I mean, I let Karis know. Could I suggest some sort of volley to spook them or something? Uh, Karis looks at you sharply and they say, point me, distance. Am I able to relay that accurately? Should I roll for something? No, I mean, you just point and tell, tell them about how far away you think they are. I do so. Over to the west. Okay. Uh, Karis pulls out a very large arrow and uh, draws it back. And as they do, something begins to happen uh, in the area where the arrow connects to uh, their auditor's gauntlet. And the arrow begins to glow orange. And Karis aims up and fires an arrow into the sky. And it streaks through the air like a burning brand, arcing up high. And then I'm going to give her, I'm going to give them a bonus for the information you've given them. Oops, I think I did something wrong. There we go. And I'm just going to have the scouts attempt to defend against an attack from an unseen distance. No, they don't have athletics. Oh, lucky them. All right, so the arrow streaks up into the air and flies sort of in the direction of where you think those scouts are. Uh, and you can feel, Maeve, the scouts starting to... Uh, they seem to notice it coming, and they begin to scatter into different directions. Which turns out to be lucky for them, because when the arrow touches the ground, it explodes. Like a grenade going off. Alright, and Karis uh, turns to look at you and they say, Did I get them? No, they saw it, but we're keeping them on edge. I will keep you appraised of their location. They nod. Please do. Alright, is Zonin back yet? No. Alright, Keva. You are attempting to put up the uh, tarps and such uh, along this hole in the starboard side of the ship. And that's going to be a... Yes. Uh, it's going to be a crafts roll, but Keva okay. is not, like, you're not... Textiles aren't your thing. Cheese is. So... Yeah. I'm going to need you to roll your crafts at a minus one. Uh, but you could conceivably use your hair to help you here. Oh. Let's see how your crafts roll goes first before we decide on that. Okay, I've just tried to roll it. Okay, uh, so that didn't go super well for you. You got a negative one on your roll, uh, but you can yes. uh, attempt to re-roll with a, a fate point, or you can, yeah, I mean, you can attempt to re-roll with a fate, fate point and maybe use one of your uh, hair things for that. Yeah, I guess... I guess part of the problem is, like, Keva only has two hands, and she's going to try to use her hair to be, like, an extra pair of hands here. So um, I'm going to use the skill... Uh, hidden Arsenal? With, yes, Hidden Arsenal. Just was just checking the character sheet, making sure, yes. Okay. And uh, let's say that we'll just assume that Zonin is helping wherever Jason's gone. We'll assume Zonin's helping, so we'll add a plus one to that as well. On your re -roll. Oh, I'm definitely helping. Oh, good, you're back. So do I uh, re-roll crafts again? Yeah. With a, with a plus one instead of a minus one this time? Yeah. We're on the edges of our seats. I'm shaking with anticipation. Damn! Asian. That's a very Whoa, good roll. five. Yeah, good job. All right, so between the two of you, you are able to start getting those uh, tapestries and stuff put up around this hole. And as you are sort of struggling to keep the stuff together, your hair starts shooting out and sort of um, zipping in between these disparate uh, wall coverings and rugs and such. And as it zips in and out of them, it's leaving behind a silvery trail of thread. Ooh. So it is uh, forming. It's sort of uh, it's sort of sewing this fabric together to make a stronger, uh, more unified covering for this hole in the starboard side of the ship. And it takes you about two minutes, but by that time, uh, you've got a decent covering, as long as you're not trying to fly out into the vacuum, um, which... I'm, I mean, in um, The Martian, Mark Watney used just a Eva tarp, I think, he as did, a seal. 
he did have on a space suit. Yeah, but we're not going out into the vacuum, so I think we'll be good. Yeah, you're, you're probably fine. All right, uh, so that's done. What are you doing next? You can see the, uh, the group of adults is starting to come on as well. A lot of them appear to be injured uh, in some way or another, but these appear to be the people that the rebel have decided should come along to take care of the kids. Well, Keva is just kind of going to stand there for a second and start counting everyone and, and making sure that, you know, we're as full to capacity as possible. You know, like, no one miscounted or anything. And, mm -hmm. and then I think she's going to maybe address everyone and try to put them at ease. Kind of like the, this is your captain speaking. Okay. What does she thing. say? You're talking to the group in the port side of the ship, the 50 kids and about 20 adults, and then five goats. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Keva, and um, I'm going to be making this thing go fast, or fly, I think. And I don't know how exactly that's going to go, but you know what? We're going to get out of here, and we're all going to be safe, and everything's going to be fine. There's sort of mutters of, of fear and uh, concern from the people, especially the children. Some of them are still crying. Uh, do you want to roll your rapport to try and calm them down? Yes. <laughs> All right, give it a shot. You'll need a good roll to calm down this group. Okay, you've rolled a one there. So that's yeah, not, that was just a... That's not a good roll. Um, so, Zonin, do you want to add anything to this? Yeah, maybe um, uh, before I leave the ship while she's making this announcement, uh, I want to uh, maybe coach her on on how to, how to use... Uh, biscuit enthusiast voice you're going to have to say something to them to defray the effects of kevin not having succeeded oh okay um i will try to see if i succeed at that and then i'll tell you what i say okay so you're going to need to make uh let's see what's the plus four one called great you're going to need to make a great roll on your rapport to calm them down because uh kevin's words like all they heard was flying go fast and they're like oh what humans don't fly if we were meant to fly gov would have given us wings oh oh my gosh that's the best quote too uh the kids are crying all right zonin uh you got you almost got there you got a good roll but we'll say that good. uh you're good but keva are you going to be backing him up on this well yeah yeah keva's definitely like <laughs> there <laughs> She doesn't want anyone to be upset with herself. Yeah. You sort of take a, a, a supporting role to Zonin's uh, words, and, and the, the group is calmed down by the uh, baked biscuit enthusiast voice and the, the jokes that Zonin is cracking about flying. I'm not going to put you on the spot and say, tell me a joke about flying that uh, people who don't know what flight is outside of birds would find funny. But we'll say that you got one. That's good. I probably make some sort of crack about the in-flight service. Okay. People are confused, but they laugh anyway. Yeah, I'm as confused. I also don't know what an in-flight service is. <laughs> okay. Um, outside, Mandukai... Re Sorry? <laughs> Yes? It, yeah, I said he'd only heard of Hub mentioning it before. Mm hmm. Outside, Mandukai reaches the group of, of infantry. Or rather, they reach each other. So she lands, and a shockwave goes up around her uh, when she lands and sort of throws up a pillar of sand around them. And so you can't really see what's happening in there, but you can hear the distant sound of screams and laughter. And you can see occasionally through the haze of sand in the air that glowing purple and green flash that could be coming from anywhere. Um, all right, Maeve, uh, do you want to make me a notice roll? Sure. All right, let's see how they do against that. Okay, so right now you're trying to notice something, but you don't. Um, you're There's something nagging at the corner of your mind, but you can't quite pin it down unless you want to add to that roll or re-roll it or something. I think I'll add to it. Okay. Uh, what are you going to tag for that? I think I'll tag, if you have the will, you make the way. I trust Mandukai to handle the regular infantry. So right now, these scouts are my Carthage. Okay. So you do that. I forgot to spend your fate points uh, for Chaos as a Ladder and for that one. 
And yep, that brings you up to a six. And with that, you may succeed, but as you do, this is stretching yourself beyond uh, what you feel is most comfortable. So you take a mental strain. Uh, you take one point of mental stress. Got it. But you notice something bad. There's a whole other group coming in from the west. Whole group of scouts or infantry? Both. It's basically the same group that is coming from the north, except this group is coming from the west. They appear to be slightly fewer, um, but you can't really tell if that's significant in any way. All you can tell is that there's another group of infantry stomping over towards uh, the oasis from the west, and a group of scouts spread out around them, moving fairly silently, but you were able to notice them by pushing yourself so hard. Karis, there's fungus among us. Karis is... Uh, drawing back their bow again and sort of aiming in the same general direction that you pointed them at before. But they turn to look at you. What do you mean? There's another group coming in from the west. Oh. oh Velico's boots. And uh, Karis sort of turns around and looks over to Belcamp and waves their hand at Belcamp, making a... waves their hand in sort of a semaphore type thing. And Belcamp looks up and turns towards... Uh, Algar and Emran. Emran, how's it going over there? I'd like to say that we've um, figured out how to fix this amp, and uh, Belcamp can now blow away all our enemies. Okay. Uh, so, let's see. Give me one more crafts roll to see if you can. Well, actually, do you want to do a crafts roll or a will roll? You can either do a crafts roll to see if it looks like it's been fixed, or a will roll to see if you can look inside it and see if those connections are all set. Is this a flux capacitor so we can go back in time and tell ourselves not to fiddle with the spaceship? <laughs> if only. I think Emran is actually going to try and physically fix it with his own hands as opposed to trying to force it. Yeah, so that's what the two of you have been working on is, is fixing it. So uh, this is essentially you're, you're feeling it out and deciding, yes, this is fixed based on my experience. Okay. So that would be the crafts roll that you want to roll. And for crafts, you got to rank a good roll. Okay, that didn't happen. It did not. I think I'm going to burn my last phase point, though. Okay. I'm going to invoke, this might come in handy later, and um, I have like a, I have an electrical suture that I must have taken from the mechanical closet all those weeks ago. Okay. And I'm just going to re-roll. All right, let's see how it goes. Perfect. How is this your last one, though? You didn't refresh after last session? My bad. Yeah, you should still have, I mean, a... This is a new session, so you all started off with three uh, in this scene. Okay, so uh, you are able to see that the amp is indeed fixed, um, and you're about to give uh, Belcamp the thumbs up before you realize, oh, right, and you you put the uh, panel back on over the guts of it, because that could have gone poorly. Uh, and so you, you're you still sort of seeing through your, through your blade and stuff, but you get a, a momentary uh, glimpse of the groups approaching from the west, now that you sort of know where to quote-unquote look. And you can see that they're coming from over there, and there doesn't appear to be anyone defending that direction. Now, you have been asked, of course, to guard Belcamp and Algar, but you have forged this blade, and you must wield it. If you go to face these enemies in the west, then you will be leaving Algar and Belcamp undefended against the forces coming from the north. But if you accept this compel, then you will have to head west to take on that group. So I deny the compel. You can, okay, you can spend a fate point to not take the compel and remain here. So right. I'll give you, the, give you that tasty fate point, and I turn to Belcamp and say, like, just gritting my teeth and looking completely incensed, whatever you're going to do, do it now. Belcamp sort of gives you a goofy smile, and, uh, he says, hey man, they only keep me around because I do one thing, but I do it real well. And he raises a hand above his head, and you see that he's got uh, a pick in that hand, and he adjusts his other hand on the neck of his guitar. Wait, does he have the pick of destiny? It's a nice looking pick. I'm thinking that it's more like Marty with that amp at the beginning of Back to the Future. Uh, Algar, as this is happening, uh, gets out her drumsticks and counts out one, two, three, four, boom. Oh, good. Um, Belcamp manages an epic rapport roll 
uh, bell camp has a unique ability and you hear a power cord explode out of the amp and sort of you can almost see it as it ripples across the desert it's not making the sand move or anything but you can almost sort of see the wall of sound uh, that stretches out from the central point of bell camp in all different directions and as it does the uh, dust around the battle between mandukai and the infantry clears away you can see that she is struggling because she's having to dodge arrows while she is battling the infantry as well plus the person who appears to be in charge of the infantry you recognize a sergeant uh, is keeping her on her toes not that her feet are touching the ground but you know metaphorically speaking but two of the infantry are down but at the sound of the guitar you can sort of see when the sound reaches her uh, the glow that is her body intensifies and she seems to start moving more quickly than before and with greater purpose and, and ferocity and the uh, momentum tips back in her favor okay um good what should we do next who do we want to check in on well i think zonin would have made his way to the ridge by this point maybe you've decided to leave keva alone in the ship Oh, no. Oh, no. Um, I feel Kevin like... Kevin needs her emotional support zone in. Yeah. Zone in. I feel like I can be compelled either way. Because blood is thicker than water, you know that you should not leave Keva. But if you do not go outside, you are leaving Maeve and uh, Emrin alone to face the army. I do recognize the blood is thicker than water and I stay with Keva. Okay, you've accepted my compel. Make sure that you mark that down for the end of this scene. Keva, are you plugging back into the ship? Yep. You plug back into the ship and it eagerly sucks you in and is sort of repeating that feeling to you. Go fast, go fast, go fast, go fast. Um, it's, like, it's like a sonic fanboy or something. In a lot of ways. You also feel sort of a deeper... There is something else that's sort of causing this ship stress. There's a, a sort of a deep anxiety that it is feeling, and it's not immediately apparent to you what it is, but you could probably figure it out with a with a, an average empathy roll. Okay, let's fire up the old dice. Okay, let's see. No, it's my skill! Why is it only one? <laughs> you rolled three negatives, that's why. Um, all right, so you can't quite figure out what it is that's bothering the ship, but, uh, you know, all you can tell right now is that it wants to go fast and it is expecting you to fulfill your promise. Okay, um, so I guess now that it is like when you start a car, like, you don't have, like, you've turned on, like, the radio or, or whatever, but you haven't actually gotten the engine to turn over. Then she kind of does that twist of the key that turns the engine on. Okay. You can hear, and in fact, everyone can hear, the sound of those engines roaring to life. And sand begins to billow up all around the ship, like a tornado of it, as various engines and thrusters and other repulsor-type things come online. And Keva, you just sort of get a holistic sense of what the ship is doing. You can't really tell what any specific part of it is up to. That would be more sort of Emrin's uh, purview. But you get the impression holistically that the ship is trying to burrow itself out of the sand where it has crashed. Okay. And the ship is sort of bucking and rearing and... Uh, Zonin, where are you when this is happening? Uh, I think I'm just with the... No, I'll be in the cockpit, cockpit with Kevin. Are you in a chair? Or are you standing? What you doing? Uh, I'm probably taking a seat. Okay. Um, I want you to roll notice. And if you get a good notice roll, this will make things a little bit easier for you in the next check. Well, I've got <laughs> bad news for you. Okay. Um, so Zonin did not, did not find the seat belts. Uh, so you're going to have to make an athletics check as the ship starts to buck and, and roll. Let's hope I'm uh, more athletic than I am aware. Mm-hmm. Here's hoping. S slightly. 
Uh, so Zonin falls out of the chair. Uh, I needed a I needed a good on that to stay in your chair, but um, you didn't fail with style. So at least you only take two physical stress from bonking yourself on the ground and the console on the way down. Okay, I'll note that. So you can either put that in your two stress box or spread it out however else you want. Well, what about Jolly? Jolly's a goat. Jolly is fine. Ah. It'll take more than a little earthquake to knock Jolly down. Uh, you hear sort of yeah. cries of, of concern from the area to the uh, to the port and some to the starford, starboard where some of the passengers have moved to try and balance out the weight. But uh, no sounds of pain, so perhaps they found some type of straps with which to secure themselves while this is happening. So you can tell, uh, Keva, that this is going to take a bit of time for it to dig itself out of the uh, impact crater. While that's happening, the scouts have reached the ridge. Uh, Mandukai, battling the infantry, is now cut off behind the line of scouts who are popping up all over the place, but uh, because Maeve has been tracking them, you are able to help tell everyone where they need to go to defend against them. You can see on the uh, on the western side of the ridge here, where I'm moving these tokens, uh, Yartha Lang is leading an attack on them with a couple other uh, a couple of other revelers, including Anarchy. Uh, Karis has retreated over to uh, the area where Algar and Belcamp are, and is starting to lay down some covering fire. And um, let's see. So the scouts pop up and they begin shooting arrows at you. In particular, uh, let's see here. Bring these two over here three scouts, one of them who is in a different uniform than the others, and which you would recognize, again, as a sergeant's uniform, uh, appear near the uh, amp machine that Belcamp and Algar are using to play, and they look like they're getting ready to fire on Belcamp in particular. They don't seem to like what he's doing. I have something to say about that. I thought you might. Uh, in order to get over them, you will have to move into their zone, uh, and you'll be able to attack uh, when you do that. What role would it, would it take to um, reach their zone? Because they are shooting arrows at you, we'll say it's an athletics to avoid getting hurt. Understood. And I'm just going to have this against a sort of passive um, average difficulty. All right, and you succeed. You're able to sort of bull your way through the rain of arrows. You maybe got your shield up and the arrows plink off of you. And you dive into the midst of these three scouts, or the two scouts and the scout sergeant. What do you want to do to them? I'm going to um, speak to them sternly with the edge of my blade. Okay. This is the first time you have struck at somebody with a sword with the intent of harming them, I believe. Your other this fights have been fist fights, I, as I recall. So keep that in mind as you are thinking about how Emran feels at this moment. Uh, so are you attacking the regular scouts or the sergeant? I'm going to take out the regular scouts first. Okay. So roll your fight. <laughs> In the immortal words of Captain Falcon, show your moves. A two. You got a two? Let's see how they do. You're attacking uh, two of them, so they get to sort of defend together, but they don't defend too well. So you are uh, sort of swiping at them with your sword expertly, and your your vision is sort of swimming back and forth, but you are able to switch your perspective into your shield, which is at least a little bit more stable. Uh, and they are pulling out their short swords uh, sort of to defend against you. They have these sword breaker style things. Um, and they're trying to catch your blade in theirs uh, to, to defend, but they are not able to escape you slashing across one of their arms with your sword and they take a stress as their blood spatters the sand. Okay, while you're doing that, the scout sergeant um, moves in behind you and attempts to, uh, you know, stab you in the back. Just like the church. Well, you know, they are scouts. So the uh, she has rolled a four on her fight skill. She's rolled a great fight roll, and you defend against that with fight. Okay, here we go. All right, you succeed with style. So as, no. uh, do you have any stunts that run off of that? If I succeed with style? Yeah, in a fight. You don't have riposte. Okay, that's all right. Uh, Sadly not. The scout, scout sergeant, uh, she looks pretty confident that she's about to, like, take you out. 
but because your perceptions are so different now from how they used to be before, she's not able to sneak up on you. And uh, how do you defend against this thrust uh, directly towards your back? I think it probably really freaks her out because she's never seen anyone fight with 360 degree vision. No. So, so I have my I have my shield up and I just batted away one of the short swords from one of the regular scouts and I see her behind me and just not even turning my full body, I just whip around and strike her, like strike um, where her short sword would have found my back without even turning around. All right. Uh, so you gain a boost on her. She is now off guard. Excellent. And that has a free invoke on it. Okay, the scouts um, try to move in on you thinking that you're distracted and they are also attempting to uh, they're actually not attempting to stab you. They are trying to uh, push you into sort of a, an off-balanced type position. They want you to sort of fall over or stumble into the sergeant's blade. So they're going to try and create an advantage on you using their uh, fight skill, which they don't have. So we'll just roll it at a zero. But there are two of them, so they get that. All right. Uh, so you can... Defend either with athletics or with fight, I would say, in this situation. I think I'll roll fight. All right. Okay. Uh, so they attempt to create an advantage on you, but instead you are once again demonstrating how powerful Emrin's abilities make him in this type of situation. And they are put off balance as well. And they sort of fall over. And uh, the one that you already cut... Uh, she sort of looks up at you in terror as you're looming there with your great height. And um, what do you want to do with her? You've defeated this one. Are you going to stab her or are you going to let her run? Because it looks like she's trying to run. I think that um, Emran just, I think his his first instinct is to actually run her through before she uh, gets away. He, he thinks better of it for a second and seems like he's going to start to focus on the other two who are putting up more of a fight. And then he just kind of gets a, a wicked look in his eyes, his brow furrows, and uh, yeah, he strikes her down. Okay. So as she is sort of scrambling backwards, uh, trying to get out of reach, you push your sword into her chest, and you can see the life flowing out of her and mixing with the sand, creating a muddy slick around her as she dies, and the life goes out of her eyes. As she does, your view of the world around you dims very slightly. Maeve, the scouts have arrived. They are shooting arrows. You are just behind Yartha Lang and Anarchy. They are trying to get in close to the scouts, but are having some difficulty getting through the arrows. They don't appear to have bows of their own. Am I able to kind of do my own thing in terms of maybe uh, putting down covering fire while still controlling the bugs? Yeah, I mean, you've got a bow. Um, I would like to try to create an advantage over, yeah, over the scouts by just kind of, you know, laying down covering fire. Uh, will that, can that affect more than one or just one? It's a group, so you can affect the group, but they get okay. to defend as a group. Okay. Um, yeah. All right, maybe instead of that, um, I would like to use investigate and see okay. if I can discern some, to try and create some sort of advantage, maybe trying to see if there are... Uh, you know, there's a distinct pattern to how they shoot or just... Okay, you're trying to identify yeah. what they're like, what their fighting style is like. Sure. Uh, you can roll your investigate on them to create an advantage there. It's basically uncovering an aspect. And I would like to also use my uh, stunt, Devils in the Details. That'll give me plus two when I use investigate to try and create an advantage over someone. Okay. And you can see that's the role you have to overcome uh, in order to create that advantage uh, uh, for the plus two I should put just two in the modifier yeah thing. that's it exactly okay uh, so currently even though that's an excellent roll uh, their roll was better they had quite a lucky roll and they're acting as a group so uh, you are attempting to sort of figure out how they're moving how they're attacking if there's a pattern to it that you recognize uh, but these scouts are extremely well trained and they seem to be veterans uh, beyond what you worked with while you were in the army. You can't really, you can't manage to figure it out. This type of attack, these types of tactics are beyond 
are beyond you right now. Okay, uh, let's see here. So these scouts, let's say that they're uh, they're going to be attacking Yartha, who's leading the charge. So they open fire. Okay, they've got a good roll there. Let's see how Yartha Lang does against that. Oh, oof, lucky. Uh, Yartha Lang is able to sort of swat the arrows away with her weapon, which is, I can't remember exactly what right now. What's Yartha's weapon? Two size. All right, so she's able to sort of spin them in such a way that she keeps the arrows away from herself and is in addition able to advance uh, to get closer into range with them. But Anarchy is still pinned down by the fire from the other scouts. She would do wrath proud. Indeed. Okay, Mandukai is still battling the infantry up here in the north. The group from the west is getting worryingly closer. You can uh, sort of hear Maeve, you can you can hear through the bugs in that area shouts of sort of surprise and confusion as they reach the edge of the crater and see the big metal chicken ship that's like got sand uh, blowing up in the air everywhere and there's glowing bits and it's moving around. They don't know what the heck that is or what's going on with it, uh, but they don't like it. So you can sort of see that the group of scouts there is uh, getting their bows ready and are preparing to fire on the ship. Am I able to point them out to Karis? Yeah, absolutely. You'd have to go over to Karis unless you can communicate with them in the uh, semaphore. Oh, I thought it was like right next to them. Now Karis uh, withdrew over to the uh, the amp here by the western wall. Oh, gotcha. It looks closer together than it actually is. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I gathered. Um, maybe I'll try making my way over to them bit by bit. Okay. Um, to get away from the scouts, you're going to need to make an average athletics roll to avoid getting hurt by arrows. Oh, okay. Uh, no, I'll just stay put then. I'm pinned down. Okay. You can attempt to communicate using semaphore. That's something you learned in the army. I'll try that. Okay. Uh, so you're going to roll your lore, and I'm going to have uh, Karis roll notice, which should go pretty well. Oh, whoops. Nope. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, so I'll say that's good enough for Karis to notice that you are signaling, but Karis is uh, not able to figure out exactly what you're signaling. So Karis sends you the signal to, like, repeat, and then assuming that you do, Karis is going to roll investigate to see if they can figure it out. Okay, I will just uh, roll thin the herd. You don't have to roll again. I'm just oh, I meant a... sign, not roll. My bad. Okay. Uh, all right, so that's a good investigate roll and you got a five so oh yeah okay uh karis turns and in one smooth motion draws another arrow from their quiver and they sort of uh arc it up to fire through the sandstorm that the ship is creating in an attempt to scatter or at least scare the group on the other side and we'll see how that goes in just a moment still not great <laughs> but uh, we'll we'll see how it goes I should probably give the other group a negative because they don't know this is coming and they're cowering behind a sandstorm. Will the sandstorm pass by me as it goes? Um, right now the sandstorm is just the sand getting thrown up in the air by the ship moving around. So, uh, I mean, you're, you're in range of the edge of it, but it doesn't appear to be moving right now until the ship starts moving. I can feel it whipping close to me. So in honor of Nux, I will just whisper to myself, oh, what a day, what a lovely day. It might be a lovely day when the sun gets here. They'll defend as well. Okay. Uh, so that arrow goes through the sandstorm and briefly like a perfect hole in the sandstorm opens up as the arrow passes through it. And you can briefly see the group on the other side of it. And as the sand starts uh, drifting back in to where it was displaced, you hear the explosion and uh, you also hear uh, screams as the arrow uh, blows up one of the scouts and one of the people in the infantry and fortunately the cloud of sand closes up again before you can see what that does to them but from the sounds of things it's not pretty can i signal to karis to keep the volley coming uh yeah karis will continue uh firing but it takes a bit for karis to get those particular arrows going all right Keva and Zonin, you are inside the ship. You see, streaking yes. past the viewports, this glowing orange arrow, and you hear the explosion and the screaming from outside, which alerts you to the fact that there is 
a group, like right there. You can't see them though, there's just sand. Although, um, well, I will say this is a spaceship, so Keva, you can, or Zonin, maybe one of you can try to use something a spaceship might have to help you see things that you wouldn't be able to normally see with regular vision. Well, I'm like going to go ahead. Infrared. Oh, I was going to put on Matt Damon. Okay, so we'll say both of those are happening. Keva, you're trying to tell the ship, I want to see what's happening out there. I can't see it. And Zonin, you put on your helmet. Uh, as you're putting it on, you hear that Matt Damon is yelling something. And it's like, hey, I can't believe we're still in this... Oh, hey, boss. Oh, hey, Matt Damon, can you give me kind of a rundown of what's going on here? Uh... Can you give me a rundown of what's going on here? Oh, yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, I'll get to that. Just, um... Yeah, you go first, because I asked first. Okay, what do you need? Well, um... Can you can you tell me, like, what, what am I in? What am I looking at? What's going on around me? You're in some kind of metal room? I don't know, but uh, let me let me do a scan. And uh, you see, as you are looking, there's that like the the text readout in the bottom that is that is superimposed over your view. Different stuff is coming up. It's analyzing the materials and stuff, and then it's analyzing outside. It's vision limited, switching to, and then it goes through a variety of different vision modes: night vision, nothing, uh, and then it gets through to thermal vision, and you can suddenly see the shapes of a group of people outside outside the sort of starboard bow of the ship. Now, my hair, or Keva's hair, is engaged with the ship right now, yep. but is it possible that she might feel a little bit of a tug towards Matt Dame? Uh, they don't appear to be compatible technologies, so the, the hair doesn't... The hair is currently not interested in Matt Damon because it's engaged with the ship. And the ship doesn't seem to care about the helmet. Okay, okay, that's something for later then. Yeah, so are you, you've been, you're telling the ship that you want to see outside. Those people, if there are people outside, bust from going fast. Okay, so the ship is sort of queries you and you get the impression, uh, it's got a questioning sense that it's like, should I protect? Yes, protect. Okay. You hear a, a sort of a low hum, and the sand outside is suddenly pushed back in an area around the ship. It's not like, it's not gone, it's just been displaced a little further out. Uh, and there's a slight blue tinge to everything you can see outside the ship now. And the it's ship has sort of a... an invisible shield. Yeah, the ship has sort of a self-satisfied feeling. Good ship. Oh, what a good little ship. The ship seems pleased. Uh, so Zonin, you can you can see that group out there, um, and the helmet is like, oh, oh, good, the army's here, finally. We should get out there and like, you know, get them to take us home. Oh, I, I mean, I would, but those are imposters. What? Yeah, no, no, they're impersonating the army, and I I think we need to put a stop to it. How dare they? Right. And I have uh, the auditor's gauntlet still on, I believe. You do. And so I'm gonna try and uh, do a little pew pew out the uh, starboard hole. Okay, so you're going to go and lean out the starboard side of the ship as it's uh, bucking back and forth to shoot at these people with your auditor's gauntlet. Yeah, to do Matt J Damon justice. All right, no, I just want to make sure that that's what's happening. So Because um, we're all out of goodwill, and it's <laughs> time for hunting. All right, so you uh, you make your way to you. the starboard ship. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't going to say anything. I wasn't going to say anything. <laughs> My God! <laughs> so you get there. And, oh my uh, gosh! Can we get a sound clip of that one? <laughs> Don't worry, Matt. It's not your fault. I hate you. Stop this. It's not your fault, man. <laughs> it's not your fault. Uh, okay, so you unclip one side of the uh, opening, and you're sort of like, you know, almost like surfing balance style, but you've got good balance. And you lean out, and you see the, you can see them on the thermal vision. And uh, you can tell that the one group of scouts, uh, even though they appear to have had something bad happen to them, are drawing their bows. So you need to decide, are you going to go after the group with bows or the group without bows? I'm going to go after the group with bows because that's probably a more present danger for me. Okay. So as the ship is continuing to sort of like uh, rock back and forth and go up and down a bit to try and get itself unstuck 
you're dangling out the side here. It's very dangerous, but it looks very cool. And, uh, sorry, you have the left gauntlet, right? Uh, I just have written down gauntlet. It was the left gauntlet. It's the left gauntlet, though, I'm pretty sure. Okay, so you're holding on with your right arm and, and your legs and stuff, and you ease your left gauntlet out. And um, Matt Damon's like, All right, now, we don't have a lot of juice, but we can probably get in a couple shots. It should be enough for scrubs like these heretics, eh? Yeah, you tell him, Matt. All right, I'm going to engage the target assisting. Oh, but awesome. You, but you got to pull the trigger. you got to do the aim, but I can help you. Okay. So I just kind of point? Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's what aiming is. Point good, okay. though. Do good pointing. Okay, I will good point. I do point good now. Okay, so uh, you're gonna roll your shoot. And do I get a modifier because Matt Damon's uh, helping me? You get, a, you get a plus one this time, yeah. I did good shoot. All right, let's see if they are able to uh, get out of the way, and I'm going to give them a negative, like I did with. Uh, their other dodge because they can't see this coming. Okay, so the uh, auditor's gauntlet. Describe how it. Sh describe what happens. Um. Well, you know, I'm hanging out on the one end, and I guess um, it's very uh, beginning of Iron Man, where a mm -hmm. blast comes out, and I'm kind of shot backwards because I wasn't expecting it. But uh, I, I still, ho I'm still holding on with my right hand, and so I kind of fly backwards. But uh, I ground myself to see. I don't see exactly what happens, but there's a big explosion of dust and sand uh, beneath me where I had pointed. Okay. Uh, on your thermal vision, one of the scouts goes very bright for a second and then is gone. Oh, boy. Congratulations, you've killed a man. I don't know how I feel about that. Now think about how Zonin feels about that while we go and check in with our other groups. Okay, so where did we leave off? Emran. Your vision, yes, dimmed, your vision dimmed slightly after you killed that scout. And the uh, other scouts aren't crazy about what happened, but it is your turn in this exchange. After running through uh, the one scout, I immediately turn on my heel and utilizing the, the boost off balance that I have on the scout sergeant, I turn around and smack her across the head with the flat of the blade. Okay, so make your fight roll. And uh, you can invoke your boost for a plus two or a reroll, depending on your outcome. I think I'll just take a plus two. Okay. Wow, that did not go great for that sergeant, did it? All right, so that's a total of eight for you? Yes. All right, so you make a legendary strike against the scout sergeant. And she sort of brings up her blade in an attempt to keep you from cutting her directly in half. But the blade shatters as your father's sword intersects it. And let me just see here. She's got... Uh, and your sword continues going through her sword, because that is quite the disparity between uh, her defense and your attack. And she does not have enough stress boxes to compensate. And your sword literally cuts her torso diagonally in half. And there is a look of shock on her face as half of the top half of her body falls off and her legs and other arms sort of spasm a bit before falling over in the other direction. And you hear a gasp as she also dies and your vision dims just a little more. You got her diagonally. <sighs> the other scout seeing you do that screams in rage and draws out, well, actually they've already got out their sword breaker and uh, rushes you attempting to attempting to kill you. They don't actually have a fight skill again, so they'll just... And now they're alone. So they rush you, uh, and they roll a mediocre roll, so you need to defend with your fight. And what do you Dear do... Dear Lord. <laughs> what do you do to this person? I think, um, actually spending some time to shake oh my gosh, the blood off my sword, I just... They rush me, and I notice that they absolutely left themselves open wide, and I step inside their guard and just smack them across the head with my shield. Okay, they go down, unconscious. I'll just use that symbol for unconscious, because it looks like someone's sleeping. I imagine that they're going to have a really bad concussion. Well, likely. Uh, you see to the north, Mandukai strikes down another soldier. Uh, as you free the area uh, around the amp, Belcamp and Algar go back up to the amp 
and uh, they start attempting to play again. Let's see how they do. They again do very well. So can they um, play like the like ending guitar of "We Will Rock You"? Uh, they probably have never heard that song, <laughs> but maybe the song that they are playing is eerily similar, but in a legally distinct way to that song. <laughs> Okay, so they begin playing again, which means that everyone who is acting against the evangelical order in the next exchange will take a plus one on any action or overcome or whatever that you're doing against them. Starting uh, now, so Maeve, what do you want to do here? Looking around, are there any other sort of wildlife in the area or just my bugs? There's your bugs, uh, there's the goats that are being left behind, uh, the two dogs that are being left behind, and uh, like a couple of foxes and rabbits. It's like desert life. Lizards. The kind of stuff you'd find in a desert. I mean, right now I can't do much. I think I'll try to move some scorpions and otherwise poisonous bugs to try and go after the scouts that have us pinned down. Okay. So the uh, bugs start coming up on those scouts. And I'm going to have... Let me do some rolls, I guess. See if those roll... Let's see if those scouts notice it. Okay. Uh, I think they probably do notice the sudden wave of insects approaching with that epic roll. But I would like you to roll fight with a plus two. Plus one is from bell camp. And the other plus one there is from the insects being small and difficult to catch. Or actually, are you trying to create an advantage on them? Or are you trying to hurt them with the bugs? Create an advantage in terms of just distraction. Okay. I'd say that's probably still fight in this case. What kind of advantage do you want to create? Just distraction? Um, yeah, I think just distraction. Okay, so... I yeah. don't have a fight, so I don't know. Do I just roll mediocre plus three? Uh, plus two, yeah. Because the insects, they don't have personality, so they can't really do provoke. Okay. And they will attempt to defend against this with uh, their athletics, or rather their fight. Not that it makes a difference, they don't have either skill. Uh, but they are able to overcome the bugs by doing stuff like stepping on them and shaking them off. So the uh, the bugs are not able to claim an advantage over the scouts here. But while you are doing that, they are not shooting, which allows Anarchy to get in there with her staff. And uh, she starts wildly swinging at them. Classic misdirection. Is Anarchy good at fighting? You created this character. Yes, lying and hitting people. Okay. All right, so she got a one on that. And I will once more have these scouts attempt to defend. And unfortunately, they do successfully defend against Anarchy's attack. But while that's going on again, uh, Yartha Lang is going in low with her size. She has a fierce grin on her face as she sort of dances in between the arrows and attempts to... It's, it's very... It looks really graceful as she fights, as if she were dancing. Is she like the spooky dancer from Dark Souls 3? I have not played it, but maybe. I'm thinking kind of like Voldo. Voldo is oh, very that, spooky. That is extremely spooky, Matt. <laughs> Good. All this rolling against myself is sure exciting. And they clash, uh, but they're sword breakers in her size. Very similar types of weapon. I just sort of lock and neither one is able to get an advantage over the other in this contest. Uh, but, actually in a tie, that means... All right, so Yartha is able to stab one of the scouts uh, non-fatally, but enough to wound them. Uh, but as she's doing that, she takes a cut across uh, her face, and she looks deeply, deeply annoyed by this. Uh, the Evangelical Order scouts... All right, first, Karis fires another arrow towards that direction. I wish there were an easy, easier way to juggle all of these NPCs, but there isn't at the moment. This is like a big game of Risk to Maeve. That looks pretty good. Okay, and arrow strikes, uh, and it causes some injury, but does not kill any more or knock out any more of the uh, Evangelical Order scouts. Keva, you are in the ship, and the ship has stopped rocking back and forth, and it is now beginning to slowly rise directly up into the air. Ooh, see what this baby can do. All right, now what it's doing is slowly rising up into the air to get above the uh, edge of the crater. As it's doing that, the scouts start firing arrows at the ship. 
So how this is going to work is you control the ship using your rapport. Uh, so that means you will defend against their attack using yes. rapport. So let's get them shooting. All right. Uh, <laughs> that was a very bad roll for them. So uh, they've rolled a uh, an average shoot attack on you. So they've shot at your ship with their bows and achieved an average result. And you need to defend using your rapport. Oh my gosh. So one. All right. Um, so they are able to hit the ship. And as they do, you feel the ship's pain. And you take one mental stress. Sounds good. Okay. But as that happens, their arrows start bouncing off the, sh the, the force field that's surrounding the ship. There's just one that got through somehow, uh, but the rest of the arrows bounced off. Perhaps there's uh, some issue with the integrity of the shielding, but you would need someone who can look into that more deeply to figure it out. Dang it, Emran, why did you have to go and fight? Zonin, you're hanging off the side of the ship. The dust is beginning, the sand is beginning to settle. You can now see, you're, you still need the thermal vision to see clearly, but uh, Matt Damon is like, oh, all right, let's, let's, let's get some layers going on here. So it's sort of like a 50% opacity thermal vision, and you can start to start to see the shadows of the people underneath that. So it's like there's okay. an, a slightly transparent overlay that's still helping you see them uh, until the sand is, is fully gone. But yeah, you can now start to see lots of pools of dark slickness uh, where there used to be people and uh, body parts strewn about from where Karis's arrow struck. Doesn't look nice, but they're preparing to continue shooting on your ship full of people and children. I... Oh, yeah, I think because of the nature of our situation, um, I would be putting aside any sort of personal conflict I have with like what's going on and not uh, attempting to reconcile my actions with my character, um, but rather Zonin would be reacting to keep uh, the kids and Keva safe. He's in the zone, as it were. <laughs> yes. So... Um, Bearing that in mind, I think it would make sense. Zonin's going to uh, take another pot shot. Okay. That's another three. Okay, and they've rolled a one, which means you've succeeded enough to... This time you can see it happening. When the blast from your gauntlet impacts the scout, they begin to glow a bright, bright orange as if they were the rising sun, and then they sort of flare out uh, in a blinding light and you see Ash drift to the ground. Oh, that's horrifying, but thank you. Anytime. Is that oh, fish and, or uh, Sorry, you actually got a four on that shoot attack because everyone's taking plus one in actions you take against the evangelical order, which means that um, you're, as you are firing on that one, Matt Damon sort of uses uh, its aim assist and nudges the blast slightly so that the first brunt of the blast takes out that one scout, and then the tail end of it, as it sort of burns along the ground, incinerates the already wounded scout who took a who took a splash damage from Karis's arrow. So you see another pile of dust. You see the same thing repeated uh, with another one, leaving only right. two scouts there, drawing their bows. I withhold. Uh, I throw up in my mouth a little bit, but I hold it together. Matt Damon's like, uh, you gotta be careful, we don't have the filtration systems without the rest of the suit. Don't throw up in me, man. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Don't do it! Uh, Alright. My so, poor, poor sweet summer child. Who have I not gone to yet this, uh, this go-round? I think that's everybody, so it brings us back to the top. No, oh, the scouts, did the scouts actually get, the scouts on the west side of the ridge didn't actually get to attack anybody. Uh, so they start to attempt to fight back against Yarthalang and Anarchy. They are not built for this, but they are going two against one, so they get a little bonus for that. Okay, so the group attacking Anarchy uh, gets a pretty good roll. Let's hope that she can defend against that. She cannot. Uh, Anarchy takes a blow to the uh, ribs. Uh, she's one of the scouts uh, sort of attacks and is thrusting uh, towards her with their sword breaker and she sort of uh, dodges to the side but as she does the other scout uh, comes in uh, velociraptor style and slams her in the side 
with uh, their sword breaker and she sort of gasps uh, and staggers back a bit as she takes two stress. And let's see, Yartha Lang. Uh, Yartha Lang is able to easily fend off the other two scouts as they are trying to pull a similar like uh, split up maneuver on her. But she's able to like do a cartwheel in between them so that she's behind them and they look just sort of surprised and confused by that. Uh, so she's got them on their toes. Okay, that's our, this is our fourth exchange coming up. Ooh, one more and it's bad times. Amarin. Yes, hello. What do you want to do? You're surrounded by two dead bodies and one unconscious one. You're next to the amp. You can see Mandukai battling the infantry sergeant and one more infantry soldier to the north. And to the west, there's four scouts facing off against the Arthur Lang and Anarchy, with Maeve behind them pinned down. Um, is Karis nearby enough for me to talk to them? You could shout and they would hear. So I, I turn my uh, my head slightly to where Karis is, uh, is standing, firing. I say, Karis, where do you want me? Deal with those scouts. Emery would love to deal with those scouts. Okay. It's actually going to take your turn to get over to them. What if I hustle really fast? <laughs> You're going to have to take your turn to get over there. It's two zones away. Well done. Okay, Maeve, you see Emrin charging in towards those scouts. I think I'll just try to add to the general mayhem and see if I can uh, try to pin down the two attacking uh, Anarchy, since she seems to be having trouble. Okay, uh, with your bow? Yes, I will try to create an advantage with my nice. shoot ability. All right, so you're going to try and pin them down with your bow, so give it a roll. Pew, pew. Oh, and you do. You succeed with style. What advantage do you want to create on them? I think I'll just try to really keep them on the defensive by, uh, since I'm an apothecary, I'll start just taking pot shots at really vital spots. Okay. So we're just saying they're pinned down or uh, under fire? Uh, uh, yes, under fire. Okay. If I shout, can they hear me? The scouts? Yes. Maybe. Probably. Uh, I will just add some flair to that by... Every time I take a shot, giving a little treatise on how much it would suck if I were to hit something vital. Okay. One of them, hearing that, shouts back, Maeve, is that you? I don't say anything. Okay. You do recognize the voice. Now, what else do we have going on here? Arthur Lang and Anarchy. Anarchy, seeing that you have uh, put these two on the defensive, goes back in with her uh, staff. That's better. Okay. And she whirls it around and clocks one of them on the side of the head, and they grunt and they go, uh -huh, and they fall to the ground like a sack of potatoes, unconscious. Why is it always a sack of potatoes and not like a sack of onions or a sack of rutabagas? Probably because the smell would be stronger if a sack of onions or rutabagas slammed into the ground. It's because human beings are more genetically similar to potatoes than any other form of root vegetable. Well, there you go. I hope that's true. That sounds like an awesome random fact. I really <laughs> hope that's true, too. In another life, we were all earthen starches. All right. Uh, so these scouts shoot at the ship again. And Keva, give me your rapport report. Okay. Okay. So unless you want to do something about that, you're going to take another mental strain. Yeah, I don't have many fate points, so uh, I'm just going to take that. Okay, so that means you'll have to take one of your, either your two box or your, do you have a three box? Well, you'll have to take one of your other boxes. Let's yeah, see. I just picked the two box. Okay, so that means you still have your three blocks left and your consequences, if anything else should happen. Yeah. Okay, Zonin, you see yes, there's a blinking indicator in the bottom right of your vision, and Matt Damon's like, eh, that one's the charge. We got one more. Okay, well, what are the infantry doing? The infantry have run over and are now attempting to shield the scouts. So they're sort of forming a, a little phalanx in front of them with their shields up. Okay, um... Ooh. Can I use a fate point to manifest something in their environment? Yes, you can. Um, what I'd like to do is... Are they just, like, on the crest of a dune? Yeah. Well, it's there's a crater that you're rising up out of, and they are on the rim of the crater. Ah, uh, trying to think here. Can I can I ask you for help as to what it might be? I'm, what I want to do is kind of, like, 
knock something to to kind of get all of them. Like, and maybe not disintegrate all of them, but like certainly impede all of them. You could try and blow a hole in the rim of the crater underneath them. Oh yeah, let's do that instead. That would be great. Okay, so you're going to create an advantage over them uh, using shoot. So give it a roll. And hopefully less lethal. Oh no. They roll their athletics and they are able to just beat your attack. Do you want to do anything about that? I would. Um, I'm tr- I don't think any of my aspects help. Uh, so I'll re-roll. You still, need an, you still need to use an aspect to do that. Oh. Um, I see. Put on your, like, green hat with a feather in it that reminds uh, you of Arthur. You know, oh. you know who's in this ship? Keva's in this ship. I'm yeah. going to protect Keva with thicker than water with a good old reroll. Oh, I'll just add two because that'll overcome, right? Indeed. Perfect. So with that, you create, I guess we'll call it a sand slide. Sounds good. Uh, that sounds too fun for them. That's what they've got. Dang. Uh, so they are thrown off balance by this sand slide as the ship continues to rise up. And seeing as you have prevented them from taking uh, another shot, you are now out of range of their arrows. The ship uh, begins to sort of vibrate, and you get the feeling that it's not because there's something going wrong so much as it's excited. What do you do, Keva? The ship is waiting on you. It's saying, go fast? We can go fast, but not, like break out of our bubble or whatever the space station is if you want to give that level of nuance you're gonna have to make a good rapport roll with the ship okay is there like a lower level of go fast but don't break the sound barrier (laughs) if like i said if you want to right now without making a good roll it will go fast or not go okay so uh it was Will or rapport, sorry. It's rapport to communicate with the ship. Okay. Okay, that didn't... <laughs> oh, no. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to flip a coin here. The ship goes fast. Zone in, make an athletics roll to overcome okay. falling off the ship. Oh, boy. Uh... This is going to have to be great. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yes! Damn. You manage it. The ship shoots forward at an astonishing speed. And you are almost ripped directly off the side of it because you're you're hanging. You're like half in, half out, right? Uh, but you are able to. How do you get back in instead of falling to the ground outside? Um, I. Oh man, what do I do? I would whatever I do. It was superb. Um, I. Uh, just by sheer like core strength, I guess. I I use my second hand to hold on to the side I was holding on with my right hand. And uh, and pull myself in enough to get my feet kind of like uh, on the side of the ship, and then vault myself to safety. Because um, I imagine like we're going at, like I'm horizontal at this point when I'm holding on. Yeah. So I'm just I I, uh, I vault myself over, and it looks real cool. Like I do a stylish like backflip with a three quarter turn or something, and then grab onto something stable inside. Okay. You, as you land, you hear clapping, and you turn around, and you see there's a small child who has toddled into this part of the ship and is applauding you. Thank you. <laughs> the tarp is flapping from the part that you uh, unhooked to get outside, and it looks like if you don't do something soon, it'll rip off entirely. I will um, mend that, I'll, like, refasten it, and I have the stunt, what's it called? Uh, always making useful things. So I don't need to use a fate point when declaring I have the proper materials. I'm just going to like, there's some rope there and I, or like a cable or something. And I, I grab the open end and fasten it to the ship. Okay. Make your crafts roll. And this one also has to be good because this tarp is trying to rip off as you are trying to fasten it. Uh, oh, um, so it was fair, but I'm going to invoke, uh, one person's trash is this guy's treasure. And I find like a, um, a random just piece of refuse there that like helps complete the jury rig okay and you get it lashed down and 
You are for now safe, though you can hear the sound of the wind whistling past outside. Keva, you are going... Yes. <laughs> fast. And... Yeah, is like... Is there like a... Like, well, there aren't stars, or else I'd say that there was like a weird star trail going on. Do I see plaid? <laughs> you may as well. You can... Because you're hooked into the ship, it is feeding information directly into your brain. So you are able to process what you're seeing, which otherwise, were you not connected in this way, you would not be able to process this. That's how fast the ship is going right now. Okay. Uh, right now, it is going where it wants to go. It has not, because you weren't able to communicate clearly with it, the ship is just going wherever it was going to be going before it crashed. Can I ask it where it's taking us? Yep, you can. That is just going to be an average rapport roll, because it's happy okay. to tell you that. Hey, an average rapport roll. Yay. You see a schedule, and the schedule has a series of points on it, uh, destinations, and they are in that language that is in the hub everywhere. Mm. I, I can just tell you at this point, it's Mandarin. And uh, Oh... I thought it was something like that. Yeah, it's, it's Mandarin Chinese, the character-based language. Uh, and so you can see, you can't really recognize most of that, because I don't think that Keva really studied the language. Um, no, she was busy being a plumber. Uh, but you can also see next to it, there are some symbols that are like numbers, and you did at least learn the numbers, because they were easy enough. And those numbers are all in red, and they are all negatives, as if... Okay. Oh. Roll me an investigate. Okay. Investigate overcome. Okay. All you can gather from that is that the ship thinks it's late. Uh, the it ship has, what? The ship thinks it's late, and it has highlighted one of the points on the list. Uh, that's one down from the top of the list. There's a check mark next to the one at the top of the list now, where there wasn't when you first left. And the next one, there's a countdown, the destination in characters, and the numbers with a negative, and it's highlighted. So it's going somewhere, and it thinks it's very late, based on the number of numbers that you see there. Okay, so Keva's gonna, like, try to communicate with it that there's a new timetable, and they are going to Hub's Hub. To the Hub, okay. All right, we'll come back to that because that's, that's going to be a complex interaction you want to have. Uh, so we're going to go down. So what you're seeing is the landscape streaking by outside. You are getting, as far as you can tell, further away from Gub's domain. Okay. Okay. So we're back down on the ground. This is the top of a new exchange. This is the fifth exchange. And the auditors arrive. Does that mean that our fate points get set back to three? No, that would be at the end of a whole session. But this is a new scene that we're Sorry. Beginning. So if you have stress, you may clear it. Yes. All right. Two auditors land in clouds of sand. Shockwaves ripple out from where they landed. Similar to what happened when Mandukai landed, but not quite as impressive or sparkly. One of them immediately pushes off and zooms in towards Mandukai's back. The other one flies south to reinforce these scouts. Dun dun dun. Dun dun dun. Algar and Belcamp, seeing this happen, they begin to play more frantically. Their song takes on a slightly more desperate sound, but also defiant and a little bit sad. Don't stop me now. Once more, if you are acting against the Evangelical Order, as their music rings out, you take a plus one in any acts you are taking against the Evangelical Order. Speaking of which, Emrin, an auditor is approaching. You are facing two scouts. There's a third scout to the west of you, and Mandukai is still battling with that infantry sergeant and one infantry member while an auditor closes in on her from behind. What do you do, Emrin? So upon hearing the, the whistle of the auditors and then feeling them land, um, Emran probably just just flips out and goes into a frenzy, and he's just going to go absolutely nuts on anyone who looks like an EO. Okay, well, there's those scouts right in front of you. Oh, if you were compelled in the last scene, please make sure that you take the fate point 
from that compel and add it to your total, assuming you accepted the compel. Uh, or if you had a boost or something on you and I compelled that against you, I don't think that happened. All right, so Emrin, you lay into these two Evangelical Order scouts with your blade. You're in a blinding rage. They attempt to defend themselves with their sword breakers. They do not. Uh, what happens to these two scouts? Uh, if we survive this battle, Emrin, Emrin will not remember doing this, but I think that he, one of the sword breakers is on the defense and then when the auditor lands, everyone is kind of thrown off balance by the shockwave, and it's mm -hmm. just enough for Emrin to slip, like just completely blindside the scout immediately in front of him, and just take her out uh, in an extremely grisly way, probably similar to the bisection from earlier. And okay. then, if this uh, if this fight uh, check takes out both of the scouts, he just immediately runs up and runs the other through. Your vision dims. It's now getting harder to see. But both of the scouts lie dead in front of you. Karis, um, seeing the auditors arrive, immediately swivels and begins to fire on the auditor that's attacking Mandukai. You see Karis with an uncharacteristic level of emotion on their face as they begin their attack. That's not great. Yeah. Uh, Karis fires another one of their arrows, and the auditor without even looking away from Mandukai, holds up a gauntlet and blasts it out of the sky and continues its uh, beeline towards Mandukai. Yartha and Anarchy seeing the auditor? Hmm, let's see. Well, they run. They start running east. Maeve, that leaves you exposed. You still have that last uh, scout under fire, uh, but you can see the auditor and you see Emrin carving his way towards them. What do you do? I will investigate the otter and try to find a weakness. Okay. You have had some time with the auditor's helmet and gauntlet before, so I will give you a plus one on this check. This has created an advantage. Does that mean that she has a total of plus two because she's also being cheered on by Belcamp? Uh, yeah, you get another plus one also because of Belcamp. Okay, so it's a six total then. Okay. And they will use, I guess, Deceive for that? All right. So you succeed with Style there, uh, and you discover that the uh, Auditor is, well, it, it is focused on hurting things with heat. And from what you can tell, it is designed around avoiding heat and conventional weaponry. So things other than that might have a chance. Perhaps like a poisonous bug. So like unconventional weaponry would be effective? Yeah, unconventional weaponry or something other than heat in terms of an elemental type thing. Something like a sword made out of starship hull material. Maybe. I mean, we'll see if, uh, if you get there. It's certainly not a conventional weapon. Or perhaps a poisonous animal or insect. Um, if you can find one small enough and it is able to find some seam in the auditor armor through which it can squeeze, maybe. So that's what you have discovered. And where were we? Mandukai. All right, Mandukai hears the sound of the auditor approaching and she seems to have sort of a renewed fury in her attacks against the infantry sergeant like she's trying to dispatch them before the auditor gets to her. She doesn't look like she's even considering running or falling back or anything other than fighting this auditor when it gets there, but she seems like she wants to finish this off before she moves on to the next task. She has a fierce grin on her face, for those of you who can see that far. Oh, and can I shout my discovery to just anyone who can hear me after I make it? You can shout it, and Emrin could hear you if he weren't in a berserker rage. Gotcha. It's what I do. Okay, so Mandakai rolls a fantastic fight roll, and the sergeant... Dang. All right, so the sergeant is able to parry Mandukai's blade, but Mandukai uses one of her fate points, which is just one of my fate points, and activates her stunt, one of her stunts. Mandukai is basically the closest I get to playing a character. <laughs> she activates her aspect, I am an unstoppable force, and she continues to push back against the infantry sergeant's blade until she is able to slip past it and uses her monk spade sort of to keep that entangled and just slams her head into the infantry sergeant's nose 
and she laughs as she's doing that even though you can now see that there's like blood coming from a wound in her forehead which she does not seem to have noticed uh, so that brings her up to an eight and she uh, all right the infantry sergeant takes a stress box worth of damage and sort of staggers back but uh, is able to whip her sword back up uh, into into place before Mandukai can finish her off. The other infantry sergeant tries to get in on the action, oof, uh, but is unable to get through Mandukai's defenses. She catches that one's sword in her glowing hand and sort of smoke is rising from it and she just shoves him back. And we will take a look over at what is happening on the ship. Keva, you wanted to communicate with the ship that there is a new schedule and that the ship does not need to go to that place, but instead to the hub. Exactly. Make me that good rapport roll. You're not having <laughs> a lot of luck with your rapport rolls. Uh, I know. Zero. All right. Uh, so you are attempting to communicate to the ship that you want it to go to the hub, but what it understands from you is first it hears new schedule or it understands new schedule and it sort of uh, replies with the impression of yes i know the new schedule is that i am number 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 late um so it has misinterpreted what you were trying to tell it and it has it is telling you well i, I said you know the numbers so it's saying that it is mm -hmm. over it's saying that it is over 300 years late to pick up passengers at the next stop Am I able to figure out exactly what the next stop is? Like, is it in the space station that we are currently in? Or is it uh, somewhere farther than that? It is difficult to tell, but uh, the like distance two indicator appears to be counting down. So it's getting closer to wherever it is that it's going. Is the ship going like in 12 parsecs? Like, sorry, that was, that was a little lame. <laughs> It's not going that kind of distance. It appears to be like you don't you don't know this language, uh, you don't really know this operating system. So <sighs> until you get a good roll in your rapport on uh, on your turn, then you're not going to be able to figure out much. Now about is where this you're going. is the destination showing up on a screen? Like could someone else see it? Anyone else who's not connected to the ship will just see the view through the viewport. Is it possible for uh, Keva to bring it up on a screen so that perhaps her co-pilot could read it for her? Where is her co-pilot? Right beside her, eventually. I'll make my way to the bridge. Okay, we'll say you've made your way back up to the bridge. You probably want to take a seat, I guess. Yes, and I will use my seatbelt. Good, good idea. So you look down at the console in front of you, uh, and you can see that there is uh, a readout on it that's showing the same thing that Keva sees, but you, Zonin, have studied this language. Zonin, can you read this for me? Yeah, uh, it says, and then I open my mouth. And you make a lore roll. No, oh, no. Hold on one second. You need to make an average lore roll. Oh, oh no. You open your mouth and you say, it says, uh, you can recognize, as Keva did, that this is the language. You recognize that some of them are numbers. Uh, you can tell, because you've studied this language more, that it does indeed say that it is over 300 years late to its next stop. All and, right. Um, the distance countdown that you can see uses kilometers, so you can probably guess from that that it is not going to leave the station. But that's about all you can get. Okay. You're going to relay that to Keva or just... Oh, yeah, sorry. Keep it, un I... keep it under your hat, as it were. No, no, no. I'll, uh... Hats off to you for that one. But no, I'm going to tell Keva what I've read. And speaking of which, are you wearing your helmet still or have you taken it off? Uh, I'm wearing my helmet still. Okay. So you hear the auditor voice as Zonin is speaking to you. Uh, Keva, like, visibly flinches, like, ah! And then, um, but then, like, composes herself and is like, okay, uh, yeah, okay, good. <laughs> so maybe by the time we get there, I can, at, at least we aren't leaving the station and I can keep on trying to get this to work. And there was a roll right there. Oh, yeah, that's something else. I'll get to that. I, I was afraid, I'm afraid that Keva's hair has reacted. Okay. You were surprised by that and, and put off by it. 
Uh, and the ship sensing that sends you a query that you sort of feel like it's asking if you're comfortable. Just startled. Okay. And so that roll I made was the group of Evangelical Order infantry and scouts to the west of where the ship used to be overcoming the sand slide so that they can begin marching on the compound. Good. I was afraid... Well, I guess not good, but I mean, I was afraid for a second there that we were going to have to deal with this wild and crazy hair. <laughs> not yet. Uh, okay. I think we should take a little break. What about you? Yeah. That's okay. All right, good. So let's take a break, and uh, when we return, we will go back to the top of the exchange and see how Emran deals with the foes that he's facing. <laughs> 